Hey, good morning to you uh, again. Uh, my name is Mitchell Yost. I'm the associate pastor here. If this is your first time here, welcome to Heritage. I'm really excited to uh, be preaching the word this morning, and we will dive in in just a moment. Um, just a, a little bit of why we're doing what we're doing today. Pastor Chris uh, just finished our series on the church, right? What we believe, why we gather, how we gather, what we do when we gather, etc. And the next week, we're going to be jumping into the book of John and the gospel of John. So we have uh, a fill week this week. And in, in thinking of what to, uh, what to explore together this morning, what to look in the scriptures for this morning, I was thinking about what are important things that we need to hear as a body that we might not hear often. Let's take a pause there this morning. So if we're going sequentially, uh, through a text, say we're jumping into the Gospel of John next week, right? And we're going John 14, John 15, John 16, guess what comes after that? John 17, right? That's sequential expository preaching. If we're doing that, God is going to bring us through a lot of different topics, right? We're going to see lots of things in the Scripture. But in thinking, uh, what might be some things that, you know, we might not talk about maybe enough uh, what is something that we all experience and need to hear a word from the scriptures about? And a couple of things came to mind, and a lot of them are not so happy things, right? Often we will forget that the Bible has a minor key. It isn't all rainbows and butterflies and a bunch of cute animals on an ark, though those are there. There is suffering. Where there is Psalm 150, Psalm 148, Psalm 145, praise the Lord, bless the Lord, my soul, there's Psalm 88. My soul is full of trouble and my life draws near to the grave. Did you know that was in the Bible? Where there's the transfiguration of Jesus, there is the betrayal, the arrest, the scourging, the beating, and the crucifixion of Jesus. There is suffering. There is questioning these are all coming from the, from the book of Psalms. Why do the wicked seem to prosper? How long will you wait to save me, Lord? Why do you seem so far in times of trouble? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is sorrow. David weeps over his sin in Psalm 51. Paul is both perplexed and wishing himself to be thrown into hell for the sake of Christ saving his Jewish brothers and sisters. That is Romans chapter 9. Jesus weeps over Lazarus. The disciples are in anguish and are weeping over Jesus' death and burial. So there's suffering, there's questioning, there's sorrow, and there's talk of hopelessness. And today where we will land is talk of meaninglessness. Does that sound exciting? Maybe not, but it is where we will be this morning. We live in a world today that is constantly being pulled in two different directions regarding purpose and meaning. It's not that we live in a world that rejects purpose and meaning altogether. We'll get there. But there are those in this world that give the world false hope and false meaning through all kinds of things. Telling humanity that life is about this or that or that thing over there. And then when they get tired of telling people that life is about this thing or that thing, what do they do? They move on to, oh, it's actually about that over there. And Christians call this idolatry. It's not that the world is idolaters and we're not. We know that we are redeemed by the blood of Christ. And though I myself am an idolater, I have been brought into the covenant of grace and God has made me new. If you've put your faith in Jesus, you're there as well. But we see it for what it is, right? So there's that direction. And then there are those who, as we will see, rightly assess this world if there is no God as incoherent, meaningless, and of no value. And because of this, we just do what we want and try to create our own meaning. We can put this uh, direction under the category of atheism, rejection of God, but philosophically there are, there are two kind of big words here, philosophies that this direction is going towards call these the philosophies of nihilism. There's a thousand dollar word for you this morning. Nihilism is the belief that life is utterly meaningless. It, it has no value. Or the false positives of existentialism, which is kind of a happy nihilism. And it says that since life is meaningless, we make our own meaning in this life. 
And the question to ask today is, what does the Bible teach about meaning and purpose in this life? And the answer, at least part of the answer, uh, at first may in fact surprise you. And just, just some clear things this morning, especially if you're a guest this morning, the goal of today is not for you to leave saying, well, now I feel terrible, or wow, that was a downer, but to equip us to think biblically and theologically accurate things about ourselves and the world we live in. Why? Because what we believe influences what we do, right? And if you find yourself thinking uh, over the next few minutes, over the next 20 minutes, wow, is this ever going to get better? Just hang on. And with that said, let's move into the book of Ecclesiastes and read verse 1. We will be reading a lot of scripture this morning, so I encourage you to have your Bible, have your phone, have your tablet, whatever you read the Bible on. If you don't have a Bible, the words will be on the screen. Here is Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1, and it says this, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So, pause here and and see what Ecclesiastes is about and answer a couple quick questions so that we can interpret it rightly. The preacher, the preacher here in verse 1, has historically been identified as Solomon, the son of David, a king of Israel. And we'll run with this interpretation this morning. We, We know that all of scripture has one divine author, amen, it's the Holy Spirit. And Peter tells us that the Holy Spirit carries the prophets, carried the apostles to write scripture. And it's God breathed. It is inerrant. Um, So in this case, the Holy Spirit is carrying along Solomon. And this likely dates Ecclesiastes to really old, to the 10th century BC, around 900. Uh, So let's pray together this morning, and we will really dive into the next few verses. Uh, God, you are good. And with these verses we are about to read, we might doubt that. But God, where there is questioning, where there is suffering, where there is meaninglessness, where there is hopelessness and thoughts thereof, you are there. And God, I pray that you would, this morning, through the power of your word, the scriptures, the Bible, that you would teach us what purpose and meaning in this life are all about. God, I pray that you would teach us what life is not about. And God, that you convict us of sin and lead us to righteousness. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And in the first few chapters, Solomon will leave no room for doubt as to his first point of the book. Let's read verse 2 together. It might be familiar to many of you. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And depending on what scripture, what translation you're reading of scripture, that might say vanity. If you're reading the ESV, I know it does. If you're reading the New American Standard, that's what it says. If you're reading the New International Version, the NIV, it's saying meaningless, meaningless. Life or everything is meaningless. And the writer of Ecclesiastes will use this word a lot. This is the uh, Hebrew word hebel or hevel. And this is not just like giving you this word, especially teenagers, so that you can like go home and your mom tells you to do the dishes and you say, Mom, that's just hevel. Isn't it just meaningless and I shouldn't have to do that, right? That's not the point, right? But everything is this. The writer of Ecclesiastes will point, that's hevel, that's hevel, that's hevel. So now we know a Hebrew word this morning. Everything is this. Everything is vanity. Everything is meaningless. And Solomon's saying that whatever you look at in this world that you think has value, it is worthless. It has no meaning. Say, I thought this was a church where we we like the gospel. We do. We're going to get to the gospel. But Solomon is telling us in and of themselves, everything has no meaning. Look at verse 3. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Toil is work, right? Right? A generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and comes back to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. Not very inspiring. Verse 3 tells us something really happy. What is life about? You work, and then you die. 
You haul hay, and then you die. You pull weeds, then you die. Change diapers, pay taxes, and then you perish. Verse 4 tells us that people are born and people die, but what keeps going? The earth keeps going. Nature keeps going, right? It's not something that's really nice to think about that when I pass from this earth, unless Jesus comes before that, that the world will just keep spinning, just keep going. And Solomon says in verses 5 through 7 that nature is in fact repetitive. It just goes in a circle We know because the world is round, the wind goes around, and where does it go? It comes back. The sun goes down, and guess what? It comes back again. And because of this, verse 8, all things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? No, it has already been in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. So in verse 8, he tells us that nothing in this world satisfies us. And we know this, right? Nothing in this world satisfies us. What we see with our eyes, the best movie on an IMAX screen, vain. The biggest, brightest 4K TV in the world, an OLED TV, vain. The most beautiful painting you've ever seen, vain. Watching the Razorbacks win a championship next year, please, Lord, vain. Right? So what we see and then what we hear, the best concert in the world, meaningless. The best music with the best headphones, meaningless. And just as the earth goes in a circle, Time, events, and history are repetitive as well. New things don't happen. New ideas don't happen. It's just a repetition of what was before. Boy, we could talk about social media right now for about 10 minutes. This new thing that, you know, your TikTok influencer that you're following says, hey, I have this new idea. It's not new. It's probably a bad idea, first of all. It's probably communism, to be really honest with you. And this repetition isn't like some sort of Eastern mysticism, like reincarnation stuff. That's not what it's saying at all. It's saying that in and of itself, the the world is just, it's just going, right? And because of that, the downer of all downers, life is forgettable. Verse 11, you die and are eventually forgotten. And now that Solomon has established that everything is meaningless, he's going to get more specific Verse 12, human wisdom is meaningless. Let's read 12 and 13. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart, I took it out as my task, to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Solomon was king over all of Israel, right? He had accumulated wealth. He had what he wanted when he wanted it. He had accumulated power. He was in charge of a large uh, section of the world. He could do what he wanted in it. He had accumulated pleasure. And we see elsewhere, Scripture doesn't commend this, by the way, uh, that Solomon had several wives, to say the least. He was king, and what he wanted, he got. But Solomon sought to investigate the known world and try to figure it out. Many others have done the same. And Solomon's take under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, at least here in Ecclesiastes, right, is that it's all kind of pointless and redundant. Verse 14, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, look, pay attention, all of it is vanity. And this is the conclusion Solomon comes to. The more you think about it, the wearier you become. Verse 18, chapter 1. For in much wisdom is much vexation, much strife, much I can't figure it out. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. If you've ever thought about such things before, tried to figure this world out, you've probably come to frustration at the end of your human ability to reason and figure it all out. And for some of you, that might lead to depression, anxiety, deep fear, hopelessness, And if that's you, hold on, hold on. The good news is coming. 
But Solomon's quest for wisdom demonstrates that trying to reason the entire human experience, which people do, right, is going to lead you to a pit of despair. And you'll just figure out how much you don't know the more you try and figure it out. So everything is meaningless. Human wisdom is meaningless. And next, pleasure is meaningless. Let's go to chapter 2. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But look, this also was vanity. Verse 2. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I had all this stuff and I made all this stuff to please myself. Verse 2, laughter, pleasure of no use. These are good things, right? But Solomon here is not saying that these things are inherently bad, just that what good are they really in and of themselves? No good. Verse 3, he looked to wine to make him happy, of no use. And Solomon isn't explicitly talking about getting drunk here, but he's saying that even something that may be physically enjoyable is also vanity and meaningless. The best steak you've ever had, I can't believe I'm about to say this, meaningless, right? Right? Best corn dog in the world. I am a fried food guy. Anybody else? Meaningless. Funnel cake. Meaningless. And possessions themselves are of no use. As we've mentioned, Solomon had everything that a human being in a position of power could possibly want. Stuff, comfort, wealth, people to wait on him hand and foot. But look at verses 10 and 11 now. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. I got something out of it, but did I? Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, it's going to sound familiar, all is vanity and a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Warren Buffett. Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Saudi Arabian emirates and princes and kings and uh, the Waltons. I'm not saying anything explicitly bad about these people. But you pile all of their wealth, treasure, and possessions together for yourself and you won't be happy. Because of that, Solomon uh, declares that life itself is meaningless. Look at verse 13. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. And then I saw that there is no more gain in wisdom, that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, sorry, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness, meaning the wise can see clearly, but fools cannot. And yet I perceived that the same event happens to all of them. Look where he's going. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. Skipping forward a little bit. So I hated life. Because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. For all is vanity and a striving after the wind. There it is again. What is Solomon saying here? Those who pursue wisdom and those who don't both return to dust. They both die. And so Solomon is brutally honest. Because of this, he admits that he hated life. Because he saw that no matter what he did in his life, wise or foolish, he would still die. And he couldn't do anything about it. And finally, work itself is meaningless. Verse 18 I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun. Again, toil being work. Seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he'll be the master of all which I toiled and used my wisdom for under the sun. Sarah and I bought our first home last summer. And we're extremely blessed to be there. Um, But when we bought it, um, she told me that we were going to have to make some changes in it right? 
So it's, it's a great place to be, but she wanted to change some stuff. There was some colorful green carpet that was a no-go for the wife. And so we've done laminate throughout. There's a spare room in the basement that I don't know what is being used for, but now it's a media room, which is Latin for man cave. Um, we painted the whole interior. We've worked hard and we've labored and put in countless hours into the changes. But what do you do with houses? Well, unless you're going to live there for 50 years, you're more than likely going to sell it and more than likely to sell it to someone you don't know. And when Sarah and I sell our house in the future, you know what the next owners might think? They might walk in and they might look and say, amateurs, what did they do? We're going to have to change all of this, right? All of that work seemingly for nothing. And what you earn will be passed on and taxed, right? Right? What you leave in this life won't always go to noble causes in the future. What you do at work may be, in fact, redundant. Are you happy yet? Are you joyful? See that there is no reason for you to be on earth when you really stop and think about it. And hold on to that. Don't take that for itself. Here are two things that could sum up Solomon's findings in the first section of Ecclesiastes. First, creation without the Creator is inherently meaningless. Creation without the Creator, meaningless. And number two, so we can get to the good stuff, our lives lived apart from the Creator creator are inherently meaningless. So life itself, all the stuff, all the things we do, meaningless brings us to our next section. All of life is indeed inherently meaningless, pointless, vanity, without God. Look at chapter 3. We're going to skip uh, verses 1 through 8 for the sake of time this morning, and we'll go on to verse 9. Um, So uh, verses 1 through 8 you might have heard it before, a time for everything, time for this, a time for that under heaven. There's, there's all these things that God has ordained that happen on earth, and there's a time for them all. And it's a crescendo to what Solomon finds here in verse 9. Let's look at that. What gain has the worker from his toil? It's a rhetorical question. Nothing. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He's figured it out. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them to do. Oh, sorry. There's nothing better for them to, than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. In verse 14, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. Wow, we've read like three chapters of the Bible. We've only got one verse left, just just so you know. But what what are these verses telling us? All of these seemingly redundant, meaningless, worthless things have their purpose. And that purpose is found in the eternal purpose of God. And were it not for eternity, Solomon's findings in chapters 1 through 2 would be true, right? All of it's meaningless. Were it not for God making us in his image and putting eternity in our hearts, it would be. Let's jump to verse 13. All the seemingly vain stuff, we get to enjoy it in its proper context. We're really going to flesh this out in just a moment. And not as idols, but as gifts, right? Enjoy. And back to verse 12 really quick. Solomon's figured it out. What has God given people to do? At least partially. To do good. And with that, let's jump to our theme verse for the day, which is Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. So you can turn to chapter 12 
And we have arrived. You've made it this far. Praise the Lord. Verse uh, 13 in chapter 12, the last two verses of the whole book. And we're answering the question, what is mankind made to do? Look at verse 13, the end of the matter, summing it all up. We've said a lot of stuff. All has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. What is mankind made for? To fear God and to obey God. What does this fear mean? We talked about this in Sunday school. Uh, Ron McDaniel is two for two on teaching what he does in Sunday school when I preach on Sunday. So good job, Ron. Uh, What does fear of the Lord mean? Reverence. And we had a great question. What What does reverence mean? Honor. Even worship. And a worship that looks at God's position in the world as creator and looks at ours. And the feeling that we get is awe and wonder. And the relationship there is a healthy fear. So we are to fear God and we're to obey him. We're to keep his commandments. What are the commandments that we are to keep? Jesus sums these up in the New Testament. All of the law hangs on two things. What are they? Love God and love people. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, humanity doesn't really do either of those things very well. The very things that life is about, we are or we have failed at. We don't love God. We don't love our neighbor. If you put your faith in Jesus, hold on. The reality is that all people since the fall of Adam are in the same boat. We are called to worship and obey God, and we refuse to. We disobey, we sin, we worship idols, we worship other things, right? And the Bible teaches that because of this, all people after Adam are in the likeness of Adam. What does that mean? Well, we're born into a body that's inclined to sin, whose will desires to sin. We, ha- we have the will, but we, our will is twisted and corrupt, It wants to sin. Not all the time. Sometimes we want to do good, but our will is a slave to sin. And we have no hope of escape in and of ourselves. So in Adam, all die. But in Christ, all will be made alive. And the good news is that meaning and hope are found in Jesus Christ and Him alone by faith. So Jesus, Jesus, not me, not you, actively obeyed the law, all of it, perpetually, entirely, exactly, and he did it perfectly. And he did it in my place, and he did it in your place. And not only did he live in my place, but he also died in my place. And not only did he die in my place, but he also rose again from the dead as a pattern of all of those who will put their faith in Christ. For those who trust in Christ, we are not in Adam anymore. We are in Christ. And there is hope, there is grace, there is forgiveness, and there is meaning in Christ. And this, this I, I hate to label joy a feeling, but this feeling, sorry, this feeling that we get this experience that we have with meaning in Christ leads us to be joyful. And there's true joy that my soul has been redeemed, and then I get to enjoy creation in its right context in Christ. And because of this, Christians are free to live a life meaningful. We're free to live a meaningful life of worship, And to live a life of meaning, you don't have to go read A Purpose Driven Life in the 20 sequels. You don't have to do a seven-step program to be a healthy Christian. You don't have to go to this conference with this speaker and do what they say. You trust and obey Christ and are free to do so. And where is the law that made, that, where is the law that you were made to joyfully obey was a burden to you and an anvil above your head before Christ is now your guide. 
It's no longer do this and live, but it is live and do this. And that's, that's why we don't put the Ten Commandments in the trash can as Christians, right? I hate even saying that, right? We, we, we live in obedience to Christ out of gratitude. So what God has commanded, what God has said is good, has not changed since we've been in Christ, and we obey. And we don't obey to gain eternal life. We obey because we have it. Let's come back to Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and read it again. The end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And because it's the whole duty of man, those who are found in Christ, this is the whole duty of the Christian. And again, we can't do these things without the Holy Spirit who indwells us, without the active obedience of Christ and his righteousness credited to us, applied to us because of his death, because of his resurrection. But we can fear God, and we can trust Him, we can obey Him through the Holy Spirit who indwells us. So, for those in Christ, we live a meaningful life of worship and gratitude to our Creator. And we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so. We get to do so. It's out of gratitude, it's out of joy, it's not out of blind obedience. It's not out of fear, Christian. And, and by that, I mean not out of like, God's going to strike me down. Now he struck down Christ in your place. And we get to obey. We get to follow him. We get to trust him as he's trustworthy. And for those in Christ, we enjoy the things created in and for this life in light of a rela- relationship with God in Christ. Steak isn't meaningless, Right? I get to enjoy these things that God has created. I get to live a life of worship to my king. And he's given me a guide. And see that in Christ, last thing, every single thing you do can be worshipful in this life. So obviously you can't worship God through doing things that he says not to do, right? But in Christ, every single thing that we can do, that we do, can be worshipful. Doing dishes, worshipful, and therefore meaningful. Cleaning up chicken droppings, maybe that's what you do for a living. You can worship God through that. It's working unto the Lord. Changing diapers, kids at home, meaningful. Comforting screaming children, meaningful. Reading or listening to scripture, meaningful. Gathering with the church, meaningful. Teaching your children the scriptures, meaningful. Sharing the gospel with your neighbor or your coworker, meaningful. And we get to live this life because of what Jesus Christ has done in living the life that I couldn't live and dying the death in my place that I deserve for my sin and raising again. And that is why we worship him this morning and he gives us purpose. Let's pray to him and continue to worship him.